So um, I wanted to speak tonight about um, HIV among sexual and gender minorities in the U.S. and some of the considerations that we might have for antiretroviral therapy for HIV prevention, which really is the focus of um, the meeting over the next two days. Um, I'm going to go for about half an hour or so and, and hope that um, my talk will help frame some of the discussions that we'll be having. Now, when we talk about epidemiology and what HIV AIDS looks like in the United States, just judging from this room and many of the people who I've seen um, at various different meetings, I really don't think I need to spend too much time. Um, suffice it to say, when you take a look at the HIV AIDS epidemic and new infections in the United States, um, the greatest proportion of new infections occur among men who have sex with men. These are data from 2010, uh, where men who have sex with men comprise 66% of new infections, uh, despite only comprising 4% of the U.S. population. Um, men who have sex with men are the only group where new infections in the United States are actually increasing. Among all other groups, um, new infections are either stable or they're decreasing. HIV infection also increased about 22% among young MSM um, between 2008 and 2010, and young black MSM comprised the majority of new infections among MS young MSM. Young black MSM also account for more new infections than any other subgroup or race, ethnicity, age, or sex in the United States. Disease burden among MSM and transgender women compared to the general population is also severe. Um, there have been quite a few studies that have looked at disease burden for these populations compared to the general population. Um, and one study that came out earlier this year by Steph Burrell found that transgender women in the United States are 34 times more likely to be HIV positive compared to the general population. MSM overall about 40 times more likely to be HIV positive compared to heterosexuals. <laughs> Um, and we published a study of a meta-analysis where we found that uh, black MSM were 72 times more likely to be HIV positive compared to the general population. So we're really seeing an epidemic um, that has hit um, the MSM community as well as the transgender community particularly hard in the United States. And another way to take a look at it is by lifetime risk of HIV diagnosis by race. Um, we know that there's been a black and browning of the disease in the United States um, over the past 30 years of the epidemic, um, where particularly among Hispanics and blacks, um, one in 35 Hispanics men are likely to be having HIV diagnosis in their lifetime uh, compared to one in 104 white men. For black men, it's far more severe. One in 16 black men are likely to have a lifetime diagnosis of HIV compared to one in 104 white men. And you find the same pattern as well for women, with black women and Latinas having a greater lifetime likelihood of an HIV diagnosis in their lifetime. Now, when you overlay the data for MSM, and these are data from the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance Survey in about 22 localities, um, you find that that risk of diagnosis increases exponentially. Uh, so for MSM, white MSM, about one in six in those localities are already HIV positive. Among Latinos, one in five MSM in those localities are already HIV positive from the NHBS system. And among black MSM, one in three um, from the latest wave of um, NHBS found that black MSM were HIV positive. And even though there's not an awful lot of data, there have been a couple of meta-analyses that have been done for trans women in the United States. And unfortunately, you also find high disease burden there, where about one in six white trans women um, are HIV positive. Um, among Latinas, about one in three to one in six trans women. And among black women, there have been several studies that keep finding consistently one in two. Um, these are small studies, so they're not necessarily generalizable. Um, but we do know that there is definitely a high impact of HIV among trans and trans women communities. And it's not just here in the United States where we see a high prevalence of HIV among transgender women. This is a paper that um, Steph Burrell from Hopkins published earlier this year where he did a meta-analysis looking at the HIV prevalence of trans women across the world. Um, and what you find is that in the United States, HIV prevalence from of several different studies is about 21%, about one in five uh, trans women have HIV. In Brazil, it's about one in three. Um, when you look at India, it's about 40%. Um, who have HIV. So trans women are disproportionately impacted by HIV across the world um, mm -hmm. where there are data that's available. Steph Burrell also did this with MSM and published this several years ago where he was taking a look at the degree to which MSM are also disproportionately affected by HIV. And he found similar patterns that no matter which country or geographic region that you went to, that MSM were more likely to have HIV compared to the general populations and a really high proportion of MSM being positive.
And when you take a look again in the United States, it's not just MSM overall. You find some differences um, by race and ethnicity as well as differences in terms of age. Uh, we know that new infections are particularly increasing among young MSM uh, between the ages of 13 to 24. Among young MSM, uh, four in five new infections are among males and 70% of new infections among youth are among MSM. Um, and young MSM are the only youth population where new infections are increasing. Uh, with really an eye-popping 48% increase among young black MSM between 2006 and 2009 that CDC had reported. Now, when you take a look at the overwhelming evidence of HIV prevalence um, among MSM communities, um, you might think, well, there's something that's taking place in terms of greater risk behavior that is behind all of this greater prevalence. Um, and what you find is that that's not necessarily true, that the picture is far more complicated than that. Um, these are data from the National Survey of Family Growth, um, data from 2002 as well as the 2006 through 2010 cycle uh, that was just published by CDC earlier this summer. And what you can find is that there, between 2002 and 2006 and 10, there was actually a decrease in risk behavior among MSM communities. So MSM reported fewer sex partners within that time period. Um, even among young MSM, they reported fewer sex partners within that time period. Um, you found that condom use was somewhat stable within that time period, about 40% um, reported condom use with their last partner. And you also find that injection drug use partners decreased um, within that time period. So we're having decreases in the numbers of sex partners, we're having decreases in injection drug use partners and stable condom use, but we're still seeing increasing HIV among MSM, um, and particularly among young MSM. So risk behavior is, is not necessarily explaining everything that's taking place. Um, and it's not only among MSM. There's actually studies as well with trans women. There's a study that was just published in AJPH earlier this year uh, where they found that, um, that, black women, that uh, trans women who had six or more partners were actually 70% less likely to be HIV positive um, compared to women who had fewer partners. So it's not necessarily risk behavior. It's counterintuitive in terms of what's taking place there. Uh, for MSM, there have been a slew of studies finding that uh, we've reached some sort of plateau where there's already so many MSM who are infected with HIV that it doesn't matter if you have one partner who's unprotected uh, sex with or multiple partners that you're at higher risk for HIV. And CDC published data from NHBS about a year ago uh, where we found that risk behavior was just not associated with diagnoses. So the new diagnoses that we had for the 2010 data was not associated with greater risk behavior or low risk behavior. We found similar numbers of diagnoses. And we also have to redefine what we mean by risk behavior. Uh, there have been several studies that have been done, one principally by Patrick Sullivan when he was at CDC, uh, where he found that most infections that take place among MSM, about two-thirds, actually take place within the context of a relationship. So this is not necessarily what we would categorize as risk behavior. Um, and even if um, MSM um, engage in greater rates of risk behaviors. We do have more partners than heterosexuals. Um, but if you set the number of partners the same between MSM and heterosexuals, unfortunately, we would still have an epidemic among MSM in the United States. And the reason that we would still have an epidemic is that there's a greater likelihood of infection for anal sex versus vaginal sex, um, 18 times more likely to become infected through anal sex versus vaginal sex. Um, and there's also role versatility um, among MSM that fuels the epidemic that we don't necessarily see among heterosexuals. Uh, so for MSM, you have just as much likelihood of being a top or a bottom. Um, among heterosexuals, a man trans transmits to a woman, and in the United States, a woman has a greater difficulty to transmitting to, uh, to another male partner. Um, and we found um, in a study that Chris Byer published for The Lancet um, and released during an International AIDS Conference last year that if you actually modeled these transmission risk probabilities um, and said anal sex and vaginal sex um, transmission risk probabilities equal, that there would overwhelmingly be an 80% reduction in HIV incidence for MSM over five years. So just doing that alone reduces HIV infection exponentially for MSM. And if you reduce the roles uh, that MSM play, if you just had MSM who are only a top or only a bottom, that alone reduces um, HIV incidence for MSM by 40%. So it's not necessarily risk behavior. There's a context that's there that's driving these infections that we're seeing in our communities. And then, of course, there's a racial and ethnic component as well, um, with black MSM really being at the spear of the HIV epidemic nationally, the tip of the spear. 
Um, these are data from Patrick Sullivan for a study that he's doing in um, Atlanta, where they looked at estimated probability of being exposed to at least one HIV partner for black MSM. And they found that black MSM had to have at least five partners. They had a 60% probability of being exposed to one partner. When they actually cut their risk behavior, say they had maybe three and a half partners, you see that the probability actually doesn't go down all that much. It goes from 60% to 50%. And then when they took a look at white MSM in comparison, white MSM had to have seven partners to have the same probability, a 50% probability, of being exposed to at least one partner with HIV. So there is more that's going on here in terms of risky behavior for MSM generally, as well as for MSM by race and ethnicity. So biological interventions to reduce HIV transmission among MSM, really the, the context of the meeting that we're having here today. Um, as Sean and others uh, discussed over the last three years, there really has been a groundswell of studies um, looking at um, treatment as prevention um, and biomedical model models to reduce HIV. Uh, to reduce HIV. Um, these are data looking at effect sizes and efficacy of various different trials that have dramatically reduced HIV infection that have taken place over the last three years, which is an incredible advancement um, in our history. Unfortunately, though, when you take a look at all of those studies, there's only one that's been done specifically with MSM and transgender populations, uh, meaning that some of the other studies that we've seen may not necessarily be applicable for MSM. We don't know if we're going to have the same effect sizes in reducing infections for MSM. Only pre-exposure prophylaxis um, is, is a study where we know for sure um, that we can see a reduction in effect size. And unfortunately, when you look at the armamentarium of available interventions to prevent HIV among MSM, um, we're not doing that great. We don't have that much 30 years into the epidemic um, that reduces HIV infection. For treatment as prevention, it's pretty much unknown. Um, we know that among heterosexuals, that a person who is treated and virally suppressed is 96% less likely to transmit HIV uh, to their partner. For MSM, we don't have enough data on that. Um, we do know that for um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, there are data from the EXPLORE study finding a 91% um, uh, reduction in HIV infection. We know that um, condoms have a 70% reduction of reducing HIV infection for MSM, but that's only if you use condoms every time. Um, for those individuals who do not use condoms every time, that drops dramatically to less than 40%. Um, so uh, I'm not sure about many of you in the room or even among your friends, but I don't think that there are many MSM out there who are going to use condoms every time. Um, and, and that makes just y y even condom use as an intervention somewhat problematic. There's been a lot bandied about, about circumcision, reducing HIV infection by about 60% among heterosexual populations. Uh, though, unfortunately, for MSM, we find overall that there's no effect uh, in terms of circumcision reducing HIV infection for MSM. There's been a couple of studies finding that only MSM who engage in insertive sex um, have the same effect as heterosexuals in a less likelihood of getting HIV. The problem with that, though, of course, is if we're looking at population level data and we really want to have a population level effect among MSM, there are precious few MSM who are only engaging in insertive sex. Um, the vast majority from various studies that we see in the United States are versatile, so they're engaging in both anal as well, um, in um, insertive as well as receptive sex. And if they're engaging in receptive sex, being circumcised is not going to be able to help them. Um, I already discussed pre-exposure prophylaxis, serosorting, that is um, having sex with a partner that you also perceive to be, if you're HIV negative, perceived to be HIV negative, actually has a bit of a protective effect. Um, it's not as protective as 100% condom use, but it does have a bit of a protective effect. And then health education, risk reduction um, interventions, which really has been the, the bread and butter uh, from a lot of work that has been done um, over the last several years, unfortunately has no reduction for HIV among MSM at all. Um, we do see a reduction for STI, uh, but not for HIV. Um, and even though we are taking a look at some of these effective inter interventions and we saw really high efficacy for pre-exposure prophylaxis as well as post-exposure prophylaxis, when you take a look at the studies, and these are studies that came out before the IPREX data were released several years ago, when you look at knowledge of these interventions for MSM and how many MSM say that they use them, 
we're really not having an avalanche of MSM who are going and using these technologies. So knowledge hovers anywhere from about 16% to about 47% of these technologies. Um, but then when you take a look at use of NPEPR prep, it's, it's very low. I mean, vanishingly low, as a matter of fact, um, with anywhere from 0.8% in some studies to about 8% of MSM saying that they are using these technologies. I'm hearing that that might be increasing in various areas, but we still have to do a better job of, of letting people know that these technologies are out there. And that's not just for prevention. When we take a look at care, um, we know that we're not doing a great job in, across the United States in terms of making sure that we get people diagnosed, linked to care, retained in care, prescribed antiretroviral therapy, and virally suppressed. Of the 1.1 million people living with HIV in the United States, only a quarter are virally suppressed. When we take a look at the same cascade that CDC has for men who have sex with men, um, unfortunately, we're not doing all that great in terms of those outcomes as well. It's pretty much mirrors what we're seeing nationally, um, with only about one in three men who have sex with men who are diagnosed, uh, or one in three um, men who have sex with men living with HIV are virally suppressed. And among transgender populations, there hasn't been a lot of data. You find um, with some of these smaller sample sizes that there's a greater number who are diagnosed, but similar numbers in terms of linkage to care, um, somewhat higher numbers in terms of transgender women who are prescribed antiretroviral therapy, and about 44% um, who are virally suppressed. Again, this is from really small studies. Um, it's not necessarily um, nationally representative, but it's the only data that we have. We do know, however, among transgender women that when you take a look at antiretroviral therapy adherence, um, that it's fairly low, um, about 52% in one study and 43% in another. So it, it, again, is mirroring what we're seeing nationally. There's also an interplay that we have between behavior and biology that we need to keep in mind if we really want to move towards a model of treatment as prevention um, or using some of these biological interventions uh, for prevention. And one study that came out several years ago, which really stopped quite a few researchers in their tracks, was looking at um, unprotected anal intercourse per act risk for HIV transmission and looking at those probabilities before antiretroviral therapy was available and after antiretroviral therapy was available. And they asked a simple question, does antiretroviral therapy coverage reduce per act risk probabilities of HIV during unprotected anal intercourse? And this was a study that was done from a prospective study in Australia. Um, in Australia, in the study um, among those MSM, about 70% already had antiretroviral therapy. There's very high coverage for antiretroviral therapy in Australia. Australia. But what they found is that, unfortunately, the per contact risk um, for HIV remained pretty much the same uh, for receptive sex as well as um, receptive sex with ejaculation. And then insertive sex from 1999 study to a 2010 study of um, insertive sex. So we're not really seeing any benefits after antiretroviral therapy was available in reducing per contact risk uh, for unprotected anal intercourse. Some of the reasons that the authors cite for that is sexually transmitted infections. Obviously, if you have a sexually transmitted infection, um, it doesn't matter if you're virally suppressed, there's going to be breakthrough infections and you're more likely to transmit to a partner. Um, another issue is adherence, that they thought that um, many of these men, even though they have high antiretroviral therapy coverage, are not adhering to their therapies. Um, and that might also be one of the reasons why we're not seeing different probabilities. And then the last is risk compensation. I mean, we know that since antiretroviral therapies have been available, that there's been an increase in risk behaviors among men who have sex with men. Um, and there's no data that told that better than a study that CDC released several years ago where they found that beliefs of um, antiretroviral, it, um, um, highly active antiretroviral therapy reduces HIV infection was associated with a greater likelihood of unprotected sex. So those men who believe that um, antiretroviral therapy reduced the risk of HIV infection were about 80% more likely to engage in unprotected sex. And you find that across studies. There's been an update among this for MSM, and they found exactly the same thing, that we're seeing an increase in um, unprotected sex, particularly among those who believe that art reduces their risk. There's been an academic study, uh, an academic um, conversation in terms of the degree to which acute infection, people who are early in their infection phase, are contributing to most of the infection risks among men who have sex with men. Um, and there have been several modeling studies that have been done um, by some of the top modelers in our country, um, both Steven Pinkerton and Steven Goudreau. And surprisingly, what they found is that only about 10% of infections in the United States among MSM yearly um, can be uh, attributed to um, acute infection. With the 
the overwhelming majority um, attributed to chronic infection, people who are already diagnosed um, and may not be in care or may not be virally suppressed. We also know, too, among studies, if you look across studies of men who have sex with men, that there are differences in terms of risk behavior. HIV-positive men are more likely to have unprotective anal intercourse with HIV-positive partners, um, and HIV-negative men are, are less likely to have unprotected intercourse um, with, with, with many different types of partners, including HIV-negative partners. We also know, too, across studies that from 2000 on, there's been an actual increase in unprotected sex uh, since the availability of antiretroviral therapy. And then when we take a look by race and ethnicity, you find that white MSM are more likely to um, say that they engage in unprotected sex. These are HIV positive MSM compared to MSM of color. So this brings me back to the slide that I showed you where I said that black MSM have fewer partners, but they still have the same probability of becoming infected with HIV. Um, and it sort of brings the point home. These are data that um, um, David Holgrave and Irene Hall from CDC published earlier this year. And what you can see here from the bottom is that by race and ethnicity, um, black MSM, Latino MSM, and white MSM who are diagnosed with HIV all said that they um, engaged in similar amounts of unprotected sex over the past year. However, the thing that's really key here in terms of what's driving uh, HIV transmission is the number of persons who are aware of their HIV infection. For black and Latino MSM, uh, proportionally more are not aware of their HIV infection. And people who are not aware of their HIV infection um, account for about 50% of new infections that take place each year. In addition, among black and Latino MSM, um, proportionally more of us don't have a suppressed viral load. Uh, without having a suppressed viral load, we're more likely to transmit HIV to our partners. Um, so even if you have equal rates of risk behavior among HIV positive MSM, the fact that black and Latino MSM are less likely to be aware of their HIV infection and are less likely to be virally suppressed alone um, accounts for the greater disparities that we're seeing of HIV transmission in those communities. There's also data, too, and these are data that Ken Mayer and, and others had published that um, really was, was shocking and, 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 and somewhat interesting as well. Um, and basically data showing that viral suppression alone doesn't mean that you cannot transmit HIV to a partner. Um, this was a study that was conducted um, here in the Northeast. Um, they were curious to see if prevalence of seminal HIV shedding among HIV-positive MSM existed among those men who are on stable antiretroviral therapy. And what they found is that one in five of those men who are on stable stable antiretroviral therapy actually had detectable viral load, um, had de detectable HIV in their blood plasma, and 30% um, had detectable HIV DNA and, or RNA in their semen. And of the 83 men with undetectable blood plasma, 25% still had detectable HIV in their semen, and the, uh, many of them had an 11 times greater likelihood of having an STI, so having, an, uh, um, se having undetectable um, or rather, having detectable um, HIV in their semen was associated with a uh, greater likelihood of having an STI. And their conclusion was that STIs and general inflammation can partially override the suppressive effect of antiretroviral therapy on seminal HIV shedding in sexually active HIV-infected men. So essentially, if you're HIV positive um, and if you're virally suppressed, if you get an STD, um, that viral suppression um, effect basically disappears at 96% reduction to your partners, um, and that you're more likely to have a viral out, um, breakout and um, transmit to your partners. And we also know among MSM that unfortunately, sexually transmitted infections have been increasing quite a bit from 2000 to 2009. Um, CDC has demonstrated that in 2000, only 4% of syphilis cases in the United States were among MSM. Um, by 2009, 63% were among MSM. And most of these cases are among HIV-positive MSM. So going back to the study that I just showed you, if these are HIV-positive MSM, um, most likely to have um, syphilis, even if they're virally suppressed, they're still likely to transmit HIV to their partners. This, unfortunately, is complicated by social issues and the treatment cascade. And I know that I'm sounding like a Debbie Downer here, but I, I promise that I'm going to get to <laughs> 
<laughs> but I'm going to get to something a little bit more positive soon. Um, so the other thing that you know, complicates this, unfortunately, is the degree to which MSM are also marginalized in the society, um, and marginalized in terms of um, um, income, in terms of um, um, having a, a more greater than a, a high school or a college education. And what you see over and over again in the NHBS data and other data um, is that those individuals who have less than a college degree or education, those individuals who make $20,000 a year or less are more likely to be HIV positive. You don't only find this among MSM, you find this among transgender populations, you find this by race and ethnicity, it's a constant. You find that those people who are more, more marginalized are more likely to have HIV. Um, there's actually a paper that Ken Mayer is um, publishing soon from the HBTN 061 data where, again, they found this you know, with new diagnoses significantly greater for black MSM who are unemployed, who had less than a college education, and not enough money for food or rent or utilities. So there are these social aspects as well that are associated with greater rates of HIV infection that we need to consider. Um, and among transgender women, um, there's a study from AJPH which found that HIV infection was associated with less um, college education. And another really interesting finding that identifying as transgender versus female um, was associated with a greater likelihood of HIV infection. Um, and really, the authors took that to mean that um, those individuals who uh, don't necessarily prescribe to traditional um, gender roles um, might be more marginalized um, and might experience, have other experiences that might lead to greater likelihood of HIV infection. And when you take a look at the treatment cascade, um, you find that the treatment cascade really differs for communities of color as compared to white populations, and particularly for black MSM compared with white MSM. These are data that my colleagues and I um, published last year where we found that black MSM were six times more likely to have undiagnosed HIV compared with white MSM, three times more likely to be diagnosed with HIV compared with white MSM, even though they're more likely to have undiagnosed HIV or to be diagnosed with HIV. Antiretroviral therapy access was less, 50% less for black MSM. Black MSM started antiretroviral therapy far sicker compared with white MSM. Um, black MSM have fewer healthcare visits um, for HIV compared with white MSM. Black MSM are 55% less likely to adhere to antiretroviral therapy compared with white MSM. And finally, black MSM are 50% less likely to be virally suppressed. These are data from across studies of HIV positive MSM. It's a consistent pattern that we see. Um, and then when you look among HIV positive MSM, you find that black MSM are also more likely to have a lower income compared with white MSM. So again, we're getting into these social determinants of health here, which complicate some of these factors. And not only do black MSM have a lower income, they're also less likely to have health insurance compared with white MSM. So when we talk about this new paradigm of treatment as prevention, um, how can we talk about this um, in communities that have lower income, less likely to have health insurance, and many other issues that marginalize them um, from getting access or even pro proper access for some of these medications? There was a paper that um, Irene Hall from CDC published where she looked at these disparities between black MSM and Latino MSM compared with white MSM for viral suppression. And she estimates that there needs to be an additional 39,000 black MSM and 17,000 Latino MSM who need to be diagnosed um, so that they would have viral suppression rates that are similar to white MSM. So that's really going to be a Herculean task um, to be able to diagnose that many black MSM as well as Latino MSM um, so that we can achieve viral suppression. Um, and why I say that is, you know, when you take a look at data, and these are just data from LA County, but you find this over and over again at the national level, um, is that black MSM and Latino MSM are less likely to get into care um, within six months compared with white MSM after diagnosis. Black MSM and Latino MSM are more likely to be diagnosed with AIDS um, rather than HIV, so much longer um, into their uh, d disease progression compared with white MSM. And once in care, black MSM and Latino MSM are more likely to interrupt care within a year uh, compared with white MSM. So you know, these are part of the reasons why we're seeing some of the disparities that we see. It's not enough to diagnose these men. It's not enough to get them into care. We need to keep them in care and keep them virally suppressed. And unfortunately, um, that's a $65,000 question. And I've really been spending a lot of time talking about what's happening in terms of what MSM are or are not doing. Um, but physicians also have a role in this. Um, and unfortunately, physicians aren't doing a great job of even diagnosing MSM. We're not even doing a great job of you know, finding the low-hanging fruit, every pun intended. Um, we take a look at physicians, and you, we, this is a study that we published from CDC, where we looked at black and Latino MSM. 
And what we found is that black MSM who are HIV positive and unaware of their um, HIV, these were men who reported to us that they were negative on our survey, were three times more likely uh, to have HIV compared to black MSM um, and more likely to have health insurance. They were three times more likely to have disclosed their sexuality to their health care provider. And they were 94% less likely to have more than three lifetime tests. So these are men who are already engaged in care, and they're not being diagnosed with HIV. Um, and of those men who are not being diagnosed um, who are HIV positive, we found that nine actually had unprotected in insertive anal intercourse with an HIV negative partner, and 14 had H um, in, uh, unprotected receptive sex with an HIV negative partner in the past three months. So there is some transmission possibility taking place there among men who are not virally suppressed and not being diagnosed. Now, there's a similar study that Ken Mayer and Matthew Mimiaga, I think, um, had here in Boston, or at least in the Northeast, where they found exactly the same results, where these men um, had access to health care, but they were not being diagnosed by their doctors. Um, and some of that is because we know that clinicians uh, famously do not like to talk about sexual orientation. They do not like to talk about sex. Um, and there are studies that show that if you're not talking about sex or sexual orientation, or sexual orientation that men who have sex with men are less likely to get tested for HIV. We also have marginalization in transgender individuals. This is from um, the HERP study, where they looked at um, various studies and measures of um, marginalization across studies for transgender individuals, uh, where we found that transgender individuals, about 60% reported being um, uncomfortable in public settings. Um, about two th three quarters uh, reported feeling unsafe in public settings. Um, and in terms of health insurance, about 50% said that they didn't have health insurance across studies. Um, and about one in three said that they were refused um, medical care. Um, because they were transgender. So you can imagine what this means if we're moving into the era of antiretroviral therapy and Medicaid expansion um, for those providers who are not used to dealing with transgender populations. Um, are we really going to be able to get to durable rates of viral suppression? Another issue, too, that we have is um, addressing beliefs around antiretroviral therapy. Unfortunately, we have the legacy of Tuskegee that we still need to deal with. And it's not just among African Americans overall or among Latinos overall. You find that black MSM and Latino MSM are more likely to have uh, conspiracy beliefs compared with white MSM. Um, they're more likely to believe that pharmaceutical companies are hiding a cure for HIV or that HIV is a man-made disease. Um, and unfortunately, those individuals who harbor those beliefs, um, it's associated with not getting tested for HIV. It's also associated, if you're HIV positive, with not taking your medication um, or not going for routine medical, medical care visits. Um, so we even have to address some of these other issues um, if we start looking at antiretroviral therapy, particularly for those communities at greatest risk. And I couldn't talk about men who have sex with men um, and antiretroviral therapy without also talking about methamphetamine um, as well as um, amyl nitrites. We know that you know, the use of poppers or even meth is associated with greater risk behavior among men who have sex with men. Um, and across studies, it's associated with whopping confidence intervals and odds ratios of um, likelihood of getting an STD or HIV. Um, we also know that individuals who are active drug users are less likely to um, come into care. If they're in care, they're less likely to stay in care, and they're also less likely to be virally suppressed. And you know, we also need to take a look at, unfortunately, the greater system in terms of the degree to which we value men who have sex with men in the United States. Um, and unfortunately, what you find over and over again, and Sean Cahill and others have written quite a bit about this, um, is that even though we've known that MSM have comprised a majority of infections from the very beginning of the epidemic, there's actually very little research or even funding that goes into MSM compared to heterosexual populations who are at comparably less risk for HIV. Um, this was a study that um, some colleagues published earlier this year where they were looking at interventions for adolescents. Um, and as you can see, between 1991 and 2010, um, that there were far more interventions within that time period um, for heterosexual adolescents who are far less likely to have HIV. Remember, I told you about over 70 to 77 percent of infections are among young MSM um, and not heterosexual students. And whereas when you take a look at the studies for um, MSM over that time period, we had maybe zero to two. Um, so again, there, there's something structurally that's taking place uh, where people are less likely to do work and invest in research for MSM compared to other populations. This is something that we published as part of the National HIV AIDS Strategy, um, where, again, we're showing that most of the dollars that are being invested are being invested among um, injection drug users as well as heterosexual populations, which is not necessarily 
the crux of the epidemic in the United States. Um, and this is not necessarily just to pick on NIH. When you look at program um, from CDC to HRSA and others, you find exactly the same pattern, that we're not prioritizing men who have sex with men, even though we represent um, two thirds of the epidemic in the United States. So let me get to the happy part, the opportunities. <laughs> Uh, some of the opportunities that we have is that CDC is really trying to provide local tools um, to various localities to see how they can invest in their epidemics to make the biggest impact um, with the very few dollars that we have um, over the recession. Um, this is a study that they've done in Philadelphia where they found that it makes more sense to um, provide um, 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 in, uh, dollars to MSM first um, in reducing um, infections and, and in the cost per uh, infections averted. Second would be adherence to anti retroviral therapy um, in, in interventions that deal with that to reduce the number of no infections. Third would be testing in clinical settings. And then what they had absolutely last was behavioral interventions for HIV negative people. Um, so it gave them a, a, an idea of how they might want to um, go ahead and structure um, their HIV funding. We also know, too, that when you model, test, and treat, um, at least theoretically for men who have sex with men, that the enemy doesn't have to be the perfect of the good. Um, these are data that um, look at the number of infections between 2007 and 2029, looking at men who have sex with men in New York City. And what they find is just doing intermediate HIV testing or even intermediate combination prevention will reduce the number of new infections among men who have sex with men. So you don't even have to be optimal. If we're able to invest in MSM um, and to do intermediate, we can probably make an impact on the epidemic. Other good news that we're seeing is that there's increasing HIV positive awareness among MSM. Remember I told you that there is a high number of um, MSM who actually are HIV positive and unaware. Um, these are data from um, the 2008 and 2011 NHBS study uh, where they found similar levels you could see to the left about one in five MSM overall were HIV positive in these 22 cities. However, between 2008 and 2011 there was an increase in the number of men who were aware of their HIV status. And more importantly, a lot of that increase took place among younger MSM. These are men under the age of 25 where we're seeing the number of infections increasing, where you're seeing a greater number who are aware of their HIV status. Um, and it's not just awareness of HIV status. Um, there are men then grow growing awareness of pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, we know that there's a lot of sites for people to meet different types of people. We now have a site for people in rural communities and farmers can meet one another. Um, we have many other sites. Uh, this is a site for men who engage only in barebacking. These are men who are HIV positive and HIV negative. And just taking a look at some of the profiles in these sites, you can see how many times these HIV negative men in different parts of the country, from Oakland, San Francisco, Milwaukee, Chicago, all down, mentioned that they are on pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and there were a couple of them that really had me laughing. Uh, this one guy here from New York City said, attention paranoid hypochondriacs, search Swiss HIV study and HIV prep to learn about reality. Um, and then another one from Portland, Oregon said, well, I'm on prep because I know what I'm doing here. Uh, so, so, I mean, we're seeing that there is some awareness that's filtering in, and the, the, the fact that these men have this in their profiles is actually teaching other men about PrEP. So hopefully we're going to see an increase in PrEP rates um, over the next few years. We also know, too, that um, HIV prevention and treatment as prevention theoretically could work for men who have sex with men. When you look at data from um, San Francisco that was recently released, um, you saw in San Francisco that there's been a precipitous decline in the number of men with unrecognized HIV infection from 2004 to 2011, um, and that there's also been an increase in the number of men who are testing in the past six months. At the same time, we're seeing a decline in methamphetamine use between 2004 and 2011 among men who have sex with men in San Francisco. And what does this mean? It means that we're actually seeing uh, reduction in HIV incidence in the number of new infections among men who have sex with men in San Francisco. And this is really incredible because San Francisco is actually bucking the trend that we're seeing nationally, where we're seeing an increase among men who have sex with men nationally, but in San Francisco it's actually decreasing. And it's decreasing despite the fact that um, the number of MSM who are testing positive in San Francisco remained absolutely the same within that time period. Um, and also the number of um, men who um, were diagnosed with gonorrhea actually increased slightly, though not statistically significant over that time period. And you're also seeing a high level of multiple partners over that time period. So we still have all of these other things that are taking place, but still um, seeing a reduction in HIV incidence. So it's, it's something that we know can be done.
Um, this was a slide to talk about where we can go from here. Um, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with, with, with some of the thoughts of an adult uh, federal researcher. I'm more interested in, in hearing um, um, what some of your thoughts are. Um, so the long and the short of it is, is that treatment as prevention is something that theoretically um, could be helpful uh, for men who have sex with men in the United States if we're able to replicate uh, what's taking place in San Francisco and other places. Um, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, which we will be discussing quite a bit more, is something that would be a fantastic intervention tool, particularly for those groups who are at highest risk for HIV, um, but for various reasons, um, cultural, social, and many other reasons, um, these, those individuals who need it the most are likely not to access it as often. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from colleagues who are funding studies to really make sure that that doesn't happen. Thank you for your attention. and the likelihood of infection based on the number of sexual partners uh, based on race. Uh, that's data that I use a lot as well. And I got asked a question the other day, and I answered it based on an assumption that I make. And after I answered the question, I thought I might not be right by that assumption. And the assumption is that in this slide, you're, are you assuming that the, the partners of the men are within their same race? Um, actually, they, they, no. they, they do assume it. And, and actually, we do know. There's been quite a few studies, um, not only of heterosexuals, but for men who have sex with men. Um, you find that men who have sex with men are more likely to engage in interracial coupling um, compared with heterosexuals in the United States. Um, but the correlation is still really high. You find that black MSM are about 11 times more likely to have a black partner compared with white MSM. Um, and just the fact that black MSM are more likely to have black partners, we're more attracted to black men, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but when we have such high rates of HIV in our community, such high rates of people who um, have undiagnosed HIV or not virally suppressed, that fuels what's taking place. Um, so yes, this does assume a high rate of assortative sexual mixing. Sure, sure. I, you know, I, I, I wish Grant were here and others to, to talk about those data. Um, you know, what they've attributed to is, um, is actually treatment as well as the fact that there are more men who are being diagnosed with HIV. Um, when you take a look at treatment as prevention for MSM um, in other countries, say for instance in the UK, um, you find that there are an overwhelming number of um, men who have sex with men who are on antiretroviral therapy on the UK. Um, and most of those men who are virally suppressed, but they're still having uh, high rate of new infections among men who have sex with men. And part of the reason why they think that they're having such a high rate of new infections that are climbing is because there's so many men who still remain undiagnosed in the UK, um, and more so than compared to the United States. So really, the good news from San Francisco is that they were really able to drive down the number of men who did not know their um, HIV status. Um, and they were also able to, to drive down um, you know, other risk factors, um, um, methamphetamine use and, and other issues. It really helped um, to reduce number of new infections. are they informed in order to be bettering 
I, I think some of the problem is, is that we've seen in study after study that you know, even when you do the counseling with HIV negatives, it doesn't necessarily curb risk behavior, um, which is part of the reason why CDC um, um, said that pre-test counseling um, would be dropped several years ago, um, is that it's, it's, it's not necessarily helping us get to the goals of where we need to get to. Um, your question is a good one. I think it's, you know, it's, it's academic and something that perhaps we could discuss um, with, with many others uh, today. But, uh, you know, you know Potentially, and it's not just measuring old strategies in a new environment. We're also giving um, out old messages when we know that men who have sex with men are doing things that are far more complex um, based upon the data that they already know to reduce their risk of getting HIV from either if they're HIV um, negative, making sure that they're the top um, with an HIV positive partner if they want to have unprotected sex, or they're only having sex with partners who are HIV negative and many other strategies that these men are using. Um, there's actually um, some analyses that we're starting at CDC where we can look at specifically that question, where we can try and model all these different strategies that we know that MSM are doing um, to see what the relative risk reduction is for each one of these strategies, um, and then what the reduction would be for a combination of these strategies in a population of MSM. And that would help inform uh, some of the messages that we give MSM in, in terms of giving a tiered message of, okay, this is safe, um, and it reduces your HIV infection risk by such and such. This is less safe, but also reduces your HIV infection by such and such, and then keep going down the line so that we can better inform MSM about how they might want to move forward. Great. Thanks. Thanks.